Good morning and welcome to day 29 of God's Holy Spirit, a Bible study. We're going to talk a little bit about how when Luke documented all the events that happened that day for the upper room. For the record, Luke was not at this experience, but like all great doctors, he went to the people that were there and he took painstaking notes from each individual. And then he sat down and he wrote it all in a letter to a colleague he trusted, being careful to only use the detailed notes of the eyewitnesses. And we read all this in Acts chapter one and chapter two. Luke says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had been given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Wow. So hold on there a second, partner. Remember, the disciples were involved with that whole debacle of John versus Jesus' baptism. So this was a vivid memory. Okay, so let's ride on here. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, well, what kind of a question is this? Remember, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, the people thought he was going to fix the world that second. They thought he was going to take Israel back from the cruel Romans and set up his kingdom instantly. The disciples are still not sure what is going to happen, it sounds like here to me, because Peter had a question about it. So let's continue with what Luke is writing as an after story to these things that already occurred. Luke said, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That was Jesus speaking to the apostles and it was Luke that's documenting it in his book. There it is. There's the infilling promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had already breathed on them. We talked about that in the last Bible study. He greeted them. He had risen from the dead. He appeared to them as a group, and then he (sighs) breathed on them. He'd already delivered the Spirit on his end, but the people had to be ready. And frankly, as we talked, Jesus had to go back to the Father first. So the disciples are told Jesus will come back by two different angels, and they return to the upper room to wait for the power on high to come, and they are all praying up to 10 days, but still no Holy Spirit. You wonder why the wait? I believe it's because they had unfinished business to take care of as a whole, and it involved prophecy that was given by the Holy Spirit, which is interesting. On a side note, it's always funny to me. My pastor's talking about the same thing. He and I write our studies about the same length of time, so God impressed both of us to write a study on the Holy Spirit, and they're both debuting in the same time frame here. And his take on this next section was that the apostles couldn't wait. And so they took something on that they really should have waited for the Lord to give them direction on. That's not the way I'm seeing it. So I'll be interested to hear if anybody has any different ideas. Luke documents in Acts these words. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama which means field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his place. Pretty cool. So Peter's telling all the people this. Luke is documenting it. And at this point, Luke tells us that two men were chosen. The disciples prayed over them and then they cast lots. And Matthias was the one who was elected to take Judas's spot And now the disciples number 
12 again. I took this to mean they had taken care of the only business they had other than praying. And then they went back to deep fellowship together in prayer. I also like my pastor's take on it. Randy said they couldn't wait. It was 10 days and it's hard to wait. And he said, so they had to do something. And Randy actually feels this was something they did that they should not have taken on themselves. And his point was, what have you ever heard about Matthias? What have you heard about what he's done? And in all honesty, I don't know of anything in scriptures that speaks about Matthias other than this moment when he's made one of the disciples. So I don't know if that means that it was something that they just did themselves because they could not wait as God told them to wait. Or if in fact, he was just one of those quiet souls behind the scenes. A lot of people are often just the quiet soul behind the scenes. So that's fascinating to me. And that gives you two different aspects of the fact that the disciples, while they were in that upper room, to my sense, had business to finish, to my Pastor Randy's sense, couldn't wait. I leave you to dwell on that. Let's continue with Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from the New International Version. When the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were saying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? This section of Acts can be a little bewildering, so let's start with the very first part, which says, When the day of Pentecost came. So I was already stumped right there because I'm thinking, yeah, I've heard about Pentecost. I don't quite understand what it means. So I checked it out. The word Pentecost is a Greek word. It's also called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. In Exodus, back in the Old Testament, Moses was given laws and instructions to give to the people after he came down from the mountain and under a segment that the New International Version of the Bible titles, the Three annual festivals. And at that point, God commands the children of Israel. Three times a year, you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Wow, so what does that mean? Are we supposed to be doing feasts? At first I thought, geez, am I missing something? I don't think so. We are not bound to observe these feasts because Jesus fulfilled all in the Old Testament to the completion in the New Testament with his his life, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the Father. Jesus filled it all in. He took care of all the gaps. He took care of the intimacy with the Father that these feasts were supposed to bring about. Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 reads, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious, a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found 
in Christ, which is exactly what I just said. However, it's fascinating to see how God worked everything in totality to Jesus' coming, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating to see how God did all this, tying it all together with the original Exodus from Egypt, the Passover, and the subsequent feasts. So we're going to learn about these different feasts because they are essential to understanding God's tying everything together through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And this Bible study is on God's Holy Spirit. The Pentecost or Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks is mentioned in each of the first five books of the Bible. Now, don't be confused. They're all the same festival. Let me repeat, the Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Harvest, also known as the Feast of Weeks, is mentioned in each of the first five books of the Bible. We're going to end with this thought today. We know that Moses is the author of these books, and many Bible scholars and even simple housewives like myself, and we talked about this, believe that God dictated his words to Moses directly when Moses was on the mountain alone with the Lord. It's always about God's word, God's timing, God, just God.